right, good morning. Um, good morning, church family. So good to be here with you digitally. Um, my face is gonna pop up in a second. Oh, there it goes. Hi. Um, <laughs> Ah, uh, 2020. Um, glad to be here with you digitally like this. You know, um, if you think about it, going back online for Advent, you know, doing worship service right now, as you start Advent, it's just like, it's just the highlight, it just highlights a type of year, you know, that we're having, you know, I'm, I'm not even mad about it, honestly. Um, you know, instead it's like, of course, of course, why wouldn't Advent be online? You know, it's, like, why else would it be? Like, it's 2020, you know, and so it just makes sense to me, you know, so let's not let a good thing go to waste here. Um, you know, you're on Zoom, I'm on Zoom, Facebook, you know, um, you know, maybe you're watching this later on YouTube, you know, you're here, I am here. And, you know, the mode and the method of, like, how we meet, that's really secondary, right? Like, the most important thing is that the church is gathered. Well, the church has gathered, period, and we're here. And God is here, and God is here in the midst of us. And just like we sing, now like, um, He is worthy. He is worthy of this. He is worthy of this right now, even through this medium. He is worthy. For from Him is this, and to Him all things are this. Um, so He's worthy of what we're doing right now. Can I get a amen for that? Um, so with that amen oh thanks <laughs> oh yeah we have this te technology now at our uh you know, so let's use it um <laughs> so with that let's not dilly dally let's just go straight into today's text where we are at luke um chapter 1 verses 26 to 38 and uh whether you're tuning wherever you're tuning in from read this out loud with me so if you're you know if you're at home read this out loud if you're uh, watching this later at Starbucks. Oh no, you can't go to Starbucks. It's um, wherever you're at um, in your patio. Read this out loud. Here we go. In the sixth morning of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, "Greetings." You who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered, what kind of greeting might this be? But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will call him Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. He will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end or fail. It says in some versions, I am the Lord. Or how will this be? How will this be? Asked, uh, uh, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin. Wait, do you read that part? Where are we at? Where are we at? Ah, uh, yes. And the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Now today, um, we start Advent in the tension. And we're going to start by looking at this classic text of the angel Gabriel dropping this like major, just nuclear bomb of a news to Mary. Like, and if you're paying attention, like, you can feel the tension in this text. Like, for example, for example, the text starts off with an old barren woman. She is six months pregnant, and she is heading into her third trimester. Now, the biblical, this is crazy, biblical scholars estimate that she is anywhere between 60 to 88 years of age. Does that not cause any tension, like in you, like in your body, like right now, like, 
I mean, with like, with all due respect to like the wonderful women who are in that age range, um, like I love you, I honor you, my mom, you're 60, you, um, but like, but like, really, like, I'm, I'm pretty sure, like, this is like medically and like biologically, we have a couple doctors, like, this is like close to near impossible, right? And so this is how we start off the text. This is how it starts, and this is how the text will continue. Like right after that, it says that God sent Angel Gabriel to Nazareth in a town of Galilee. Now, like as human beings who like live in this westernized society, most of us know of Nazareth and Galilee. We heard about that. You don't have, you don't even have to be a Christian to know about those places. Most of us grew up hearing about those places from like a blizzard of Christmas stories that gets piled upon us during this, you know, usually around this time of year. It's like almost cultural to know these places. Um, but what we often forget is that, it's like how forgettable of a town Nazareth really was at the time, of the time of Jesus' birth. Like, even as an adult, like, what people will say about Jesus' hometown, sarcastically they would say, what good comes from Nazareth? Like, it's a town, like the town is like the butt of jokes. Like we, we have those cities around us, you know what I mean? Like, um, but where we see the tension, where we see the tension here is that God sends angel Gabriel to Nazareth. Now I'm not like savvy in angelology, like that's not one of my, like, that wasn't one of my primary interests in seminary, you know, like, but I, I can pretty confidently say uh, that Gabriel was a big deal. You know, he, he, he's like, he's not a small chump angel. He, he doesn't sweat the small stuff. He was called upon when like big stuff had to go down. And so this is a big deal angel in a small deal town. <laughs> and that's the tension. It almost like doesn't fit. It's almost like trying to like start an NFL expansion team in like Temecula. You know, like it's almost like, it's almost like BTS having a big concert in like Barstow. It's not even Baker, you know, Victorville, you know? It's like, why would BTS be a Barstow, you know? Um, <laughs> we've been listening to a lot of BTS lately. Uh, so that, um, uh, this is dynamite stuff. Uh, so this, uh, this, but this big, big deal, big deal angel comes to a small deal town to greet this young, unsuspecting woman. And, um, and w when we think about the way it's written, within the context, within the narrative structure, you know, like the flow and the cadence, like it's, it's meant to communicate to the reader, for us, that Gabriel's greeting was not only like a disruptive kind of event, but it was like, it was actually quite intrusive. Like this was intrusive to Mary's normal way of life. This is like a, like nor Mary's normal way of life was about to be completely different. So there's much about this text that's like really unusual. Like everything that's happened so far is like really weird, like really unusual. It's so unique, so like uh, unprecedented, right? Like, and, and the big news hasn't even dropped yet. Like Gabriel hasn't even given, like given Mary like the birth, big birth news yet, right? And so, so then just imagine this young girl from a small town encounter something so out of place, like out of the out of the ordinary, out of this world, and she gets this news, and all of a sudden, like she's carrying this burden to literally carry the Son of God through a virgin birth of all things. Like it's overwhelming, it's it's unusual, it's unprecedented, it doesn't fit into our understanding of the natural world. And this is quite a burden for anyone to bear yet alone a young unmarried woman in the ancient world from a town where nothing good comes from. She will most likely um, be viewed as someone, you know, who had a child out of wedlock, right? Which is a big deal back then. We don't know how Joseph is gonna respond. Like we, even, like, we don't know if Joseph even still would marry her, you know, like the ancient, like, cause you know, like the ancient world knows how to count to nine, you know, that's, you know what I mean, right? So like, I would imagine that like, probably there was a, like a fear of shame from her people, from her tribe. And by, you know, by the way, her people at this time, they're currently under foreign rule, like foreign oppression. 
and then the tribe, the, the religious entity, like the prophets of her religion, where historically they got their hope and sense of vision for the future, has been silent for generations. So Mary is carrying a lot at this moment. She probably felt despair. By the way, um, the definition of despair is complete loss or the absence of hope. Has anyone been feeling that lately? Has anyone felt despair lately? Has anyone felt like they're caring a lot lately? I know I have. You know, and in the in a year like the one that we're currently surviving, you know, I, I guess most of us, most of you, have felt despair to some degree. Right? Maybe some of you are in the thick of it right now. And so, in our text today, we see that Mary is feeling. This too. She's feeling despair. In verse 27, we see that she is troubled. In verse 34, she was perplexed and overwhelmed with what was before her. But also we see that there is a change that happens in Mary. In verse 38, she submits to God's will and she trusts God. And somehow in the midst of despair, she she finds hope. And honestly, like that sounds just as much unnatural and unusual as anything else that we've seen so far in this text. Like, how the heck does she find hope in the midst of despair? Well, first of all, I think, I think in order for us to answer that question, I think it's, it'll be helpful to understand what hope is. And one of my favorite definitions of hope uh, comes from the late theologian and philosopher Dallas Willard. And he defined hope simply as a certainty and a good future. Hope is a certainty and a good future. So with that in mind, I think there are two things happening in Mary as she's processing all this. First is that she sees um, like in the beginning, first is that she sees like God as like this, he's just dropping this big news. And somewhere along the line, she sees that like God's not here just to like, she's not here just to hear God at face value. But it's that she is here to encounter God face to face. Maybe another way of describing that is like, she's no longer looking at this from the perspective of the unnatural invading the natural Rather, she's realizing that this is the supernatural being present or coexisting with the natural. At this point, her concern isn't about this biological miracle that will be taking place in her body. Her primary concern is, who am I going to trust in this situation? Where am I placing my hope in this situation? Like, wh where am I going to place my trust in this seemingly turbulent, uncertain, scary, confusing situation so she she makes this mental spiritual emotional change throughout this conversation and the second thing we see here is that we see happening here is that once that's settled once 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 she figures out okay where this is the person god god is where i'm placing my trust in she allows hope to invade then the space of her, of her despair. When she places her trust in God, she allows God to invade her with hope in the midst of despair. One, some theologians call this Christian imagination. I love that. See, because like her situation did not change. Like she's still gonna give birth to, you know, Jesus. She's going, it's gonna be a virgin birth, you know, like. Um, there's still po the, the possibility of shame. She still doesn't know what Joseph's going to do. And all that is still at play. But she has hope that there will be a good future. Because she knows where to place her trust and her hope. She knows where her trust is. And this is where we get to 
the theology of Advent, the theology of the tensions, of Advent and the tensions. It's that like Mary, like Mary, we can recognize our despair and still have hope for a good future. No matter how bad the present reality is, no matter how sucky our present is, the gospel is big enough to carry the tension of our hope and our despair. Or, or more accurately, the shoulders of Jesus and the arms of Jesus is wide enough, is big enough to carry our despair and our hope together at the same time. And we have nothing is anywhere clearer than on the cross of Jesus. And it starts, it, it's foreshadowed here in the birth story before all that happens, that God, the Son of God, he, like God enters into humanity, into our despair, to be present in the despair as, as a hope of all nations. That's who Jesus, and, and, and because of present reality, like, you know, the present reality, let's face it, is gonna change. Like, our situation is gonna change. Like, that's, that's just true. We've seen that throughout history, and I think that's fairly, you know, good to rely on. But also, it's, it's also, we could trust that he will never change. Our circumstances, our present realities will change, but Jesus will never change. He'll always be faithful to his word. He'll always be who he, who he said he will be, yesterday, today, and forevermore, whether it is year one or year 2020 or year 2021. No matter what's in front of us, no matter what's ahead of us, we have hope because we know where to put our trust in. And no matter what our reality may be, we can hold on to the faith or hold on to the hope that there will be a good future because we know, we know who we're trusting and we know who we're leaning on. Romans 5, um, Romans 5, 3, 3 or 4 says this, you know, we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character. Character, character, hope. As Christians, we, we get to see our despair differently. As Christians, we get to see our suffering differently. Because we have a divine hope that disrupts our despair. Just, just the way that Gabriel disrupted Mary's ordinary life. For some of us, our ordinary life right now, it is despair. And the hope that we have in Jesus is that he interrupts our despair with his hope, his promises, his peace, his joy, his love. And we'll continue to unpack this tension in the weeks to come. But well, for now, I invite you um, to unpack this in breakout groups. So we have a few discussion questions. In what areas have you felt a sense of despair this past year? And also, in what areas have you seen God's hope invade the areas of despair? And one more question. What is one area you're longing to have a certainty of a good future? What is that one area that you're yearning, thirsty for, to see a good future in? And as we, um, you know, as you kind of think about these questions, I'll, I'll share this real quickly. Um, um, I wasn't planning on sharing this, but I think it's going to happen. <laughs> um, for my family, for, for Rayan and I, um, and um, our immediate family, like, in some ways, for some of us, like, 2020 started last year. Um, I don't want to put it all on, on, like, the boys, you know, the twins, but they're definitely a factor of it because we did not see that coming. It was definitely unexpected. Um, for us, it felt really unnatural and unprecedented. <laughs> um, and then right after that, um, most of you all journeyed with us. Um, like, we had a leak in the kitchen, there was mold, we were displaced for a while. 
And for many days, we felt like it was impossible to find hope. You know, like, I remember, like, there are a couple of times I had to move um, hotels and it just felt like, man, like, this, this really sucks. Um, and we were kind of grasping for whatever hope that we can. Um, and there are two stories that come to mind where, where our despair turned into hope. The first is, I remember that first Sunday when we were displaced, we were here in this room. It looked a little different. Um, <laughs> and uh, Tom and Meg and other, the other members of the worship team, they were leading um, King, King Up My Heart. And you know, the, the, there's a line like, you're never going to let me down. You're never going to let, never going to let me down. And um, to be honest, I could not sing those words honestly. Um, but um, the way y'all let it um, was there's just enough faith there for me to just hold on to. And the way y'all saying it just was just, it, it just trickled enough faith down on me to believe that he will never let, as in he'll never give up on me. And even though I may not see it right now, he is never going to let me down. And secondly, around that time, like we, the only way we felt the presence of God at the time, because we, I felt like my relationship with God was so distant at the time. I would cry out to God and I felt like he wasn't there. I felt like he was silent. He was absent. Anyone felt that? But the only way I felt the presence of God was through the presence of the church, through you. Through each of you who like generously gave, like y'all gave your time and your like and money, like literally money, like and then food, so that we could get by in the season. We didn't, we couldn't see God, but to see your faces was to see the face of God. So even in the midst of despair, we can have hope. The gospel that we're living out is big enough to carry both.